Somebody ought to praise him. Somebody ought to praise him. Somebody ought to praise him. Launa Harris sang a song years ago that when praise demands a sacrifice, I'll worship even then. There are people in this room for you to lift up hands and praise God for the circumstances that seem completely contrary to what you thought was the will of God. That's when praise becomes worship. And somebody needs to do that right now. I'm going to say that again. To lift up hands in worship when, when the circumstances that you see around you seem completely opposite of what you thought the will of God was going to be. Why don't you just lift up those holy hands right now without wrath or doubting, without wrath or doubting, and bless the name of the Lord. Uh, I know our team may not know it. I know Quest is old school like me. He may. I don't expect them to sing it with me. But what started going over in my head as they were singing that is, Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? That's as far as I'm going to go. But that's what's going over and over in my head. It's an old chorus. Is your all on the altar? And as I was studying for our word this week, because we're continuing our radical series, and today just happens to fall on radical sacrifice. Can you imagine that after that song? And it just falls on radical. We started several weeks ago, two weeks ago, I did radical surrender. And then last Sunday, Pastor Jeremy, radical faith, my God, just incredible. But we have been in this vein, and we're, we're, we're standing, I feel like we're standing opposite culture. These are not the most popular sermons I've ever preached. And I have felt very lonely in this time in the spirit because, not from you, you're so supportive, but you can tell the enemy doesn't like it. If you study the book of Malachi, you learn that there is such a thing as silver that is refined and that when silver is refined, the dross on the silver rises to the top. And the word in the King James for that is called reprobate silver. It's the junk that looks like silver, but it's the impurities that was in the silver. The problem is the modern church has monetized reprobate silver and has made the dross holy. Lord, help me be, help me be light and fun and sweet today. But in dealing in sacrifice, and, and, and I was praying about this last night, studying this, and, and I'm afraid that, that when God starts purifying his church, the first things that begin to rise is what, I didn't say the word reprobate, that's in the Bible, reprobate silver. And I'm afraid that we have learned to celebrate some things rising that God wants to remove. And we celebrate it before the purifying process. I told you a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Charles got to help me here because he's like two years older than me. And so uh, <laughs> he looks, he, I told somebody, somebody said, man, don't you, you wish you looked like that when you was his age? I said, I wish I, I, said, I, wish I looked like that now. <laughs> I told Stephanie that a couple of years ago. But I, as, as I was studying this, I told you a few weeks ago, I, I struggle with sounding like an old preacher. And I, I've really been struggling with that lately because I'm sounding like an old preacher. But one of the things I remember some old preachers talking about that said, isn't it amazing that when we took the altars out of the churches, people's lives stopped being altered? And I'm going to preach about the altar today. I'm going to teach about the altar today but, and about sacrifice today. But I, I just want us to pray right now that the Holy Spirit in the next 25, 30 minutes would alter us and create in us a clean heart because this is a sermon, but then when I'm through, our elder Linton's going to come up and we're going to talk to you basically about a big ass because guess what, guys? We are literally, literally, it's all going to depend. All the stuff's on schedule at this point in Jesus' name. It's going to depend on temporary permit. We may be able to have our first prayer worship night September 15th in the new building. That's what we're shooting for. That's what we're shooting for. 
it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And they said, no, you can get more excited that it's getting exciting around here. It's getting very exciting around here. And what I'm excited about is whenever that first worship night is, we're going to go into our 10 days and, and I'm going to move in my cot and, and whatever. We're going to go into 10 days of prayer, consecration, and worship and consecrate the new building with 10 nights where you can come, come and go, whatever. 10 days and nights of prayer and consecration. Entering into that new building, into this new season. Hearing what the Spirit is saying. Submitting our spirits to the Holy Spirit. Is that exciting, guys? Wow, thank you, Lord. You can be seated. Um, I went by this week and, and, and was able to just run by the graveside. I haven't been to the cemetery since Mimi, uh, since we fin finalized everything uh, on her gravestone and all of that and, and just got to spend a little time remembering mom and dad. And I knew I was preaching on sacrifice. And I remember um, when my dad came home from his trip to Liberia and Michelle and I were young and I remember when he set us down with tears in his eyes and informed us that he was applying to be a missionary to Africa and that meant we were going to sell our house, sell my moped, sell her piano, sell everything, sell our dog, sell our cats, sell everything and with tears in his eyes and said, I know it's not fair to you, but mom and I are going to sell everything and we're moving to Africa and we're going to be missionaries and we're surrendering our lives to God. And I remember what that did to me. And I remember even sitting this week watching that and seeing that and, and that, that heaviness that I just felt that sacrifice. Can you imagine now if I had to sit down and, and I know Stephanie and I went to Calcutta with Alex, but I'm just thinking in today's culture, in today's climate, how many of you would like to tell your preteen kids, hey, guess what? We're not only taking away your cell phone, we're moving you to a village in Africa where you don't even speak the language and you're going to be homeschooled and you may not see another person that even speaks your language or looks like you for four or five years. God bless you. We're in the will of God. And I think culture has done so much to downplay the sacrifice of generation to generation to generations before us. And that scripture, Romans 12 and 1, I want to go there and you know I'm going to go there after that psalm, but Romans chapter 12 in verse 1, Paul is urging the believers to present their bodies not only as a sacrifice, but as a living sacrifice. But before we get there, I want to set that up. As I'm going to see how much time I have because I don't, I don't want to preach a long time today. But I do want to just get us where we are because Holy Spirit, that worship just set us up. We are there where the Holy Spirit wanted us to be today. And if you're a guest today, we welcome you. We're so glad you're here. Like we said, we're ready for baptisms. We have baptisms next service. You don't have to wait. We'll baptize you. We're so glad you're here. But I was just thinking about the acrid smell of smoke in the air from the kind of the pre-dawn season of an African village kind of a haze normally when you wake up in the morning, but it's not just the haze of the fog, it's the haze of the smoke of all the fires and all of the stuff that has been cooked and the things that have been happened throughout that. Then they get up and they start it all over again because it takes all day to even prepare one meal for your family because it takes so long to boil the meat to prepare and put everything together and to beat the foo-foo and the foo-too and all of that. And then you hear the wails and the cries and don't understand what's going on until you see a special marked hut and that is the designated hut of the mother that has been chosen by the village elders that year to sacrifice her firstborn child to the crocodile, which represents the embodiment of the sun god under animism. I was researching last night, and I even asked AI, and AI says, well, even though it's very prevalent, I don't think it happens anymore. And I laughed at AI because all you have to do is text your pastor friends overseas to realize that this still goes on even today. It was more prevalent when we were there about 40 years ago, especially in an area called Ma, uh, M-A-N-N. -N. It was very prevalent. And so the entire village, here's the thing about that sacrifice, though, as you begin to study it, or you can actually, used to could go, I don't think you can now the last 25, 30 years, you used to could go and watch it from afar as you were kind of on a cliff and you could see them coming out of the city. And the mothers that had been chosen worthy, here's the thing that always got me. They can wail all night long. They can scream. They can wail. They can cry. They can mourn their baby. But when morning comes, they have to wipe their tears because they have been counted worthy to worship by giving their firstborn son so that their village can be blessed 
for the rest of the season. And then the entire village begins, as you've heard on TV or movies, the and the the wait, the the screaming and the the yelping and the the all of the things going on, the drums, and then the feet begin to pant, specifically by the women and the virgin women, and the feet the feet begin to pant and begin to beat on the sand, and the dirt begins to rise up like a dirt cloud, and then you see what we would call the witch doctors or the fetishers coming with a purple like haze, and they're throwing it in the air, and here out comes from this designated hut this young mother holding this beautiful baby in her arms and she begins to march and and some of you are just recalling while I'm telling you this please don't because some of you are pro-abortion so don't don't even give me that stuff but uh, as they're walking out I said it and I'll say it again as they're walking out of the hut all of a sudden you can hear the yells and the stomping and the tor- and everything that's going on as she is carrying this baby all the way to the edge of the river She is not allowed at that point to weep. She is not allowed at that point to cry. She has to worship. At some point in that journey, she begins to dance. She begins a dance celebrating the fact that she has been chosen to sacrifice that which is most dear to her. And they take it to the edge and only at the edge does she hand it to the father. And then the father holds the child up and casts the child into the jagged rocks and the crocodile as the village begins to worship and go into a frenzy. This has happened for possibly thousands of years. And of course, yes, it is outlawed now. And yes, it don't happen as much as it used to. But I'm talking about a whole cultural concept. But this concept isn't just in Africa. It goes all the way through. As a matter of fact, if you study Abraham, which I'm going to preach about today, how many of you know that when Abram, Abram, before he was Abraham, Abram came out of Ur of the Chaldees? How many of you know that? How many of you know that Ur was Hindu before there was Judaism? So if you're going to go win people who are Hindu, you better be prepared. Believe me, I wasn't when I went to India the first time. You better be prepared for theologians who have studied their book that realize that Judaism came from somebody that left because God separated him from a pantheon of gods and separated him from a culture where blood sacrifice was the norm and revealed himself that there was only one God and that was the separation. Does that make sense to anybody? So we have to understand that this concept Concept of sacrifice has happened all matter of fact basically through from the book of Genesis all the way to now human sacrifice has existed I remember Stephanie and I were shocked because of course in India they've outlawed all this during the Kali festival you read we read the papers together during the Kali festival they were celebrating back in the day in Calcutta they were so excited because it was outlawed and everything during the Kali festivals only 12 virgins had been found murdered During the Kali festival, only 12 had been sacrificed. And that was illegal, of course. But they were talking about how modern they had gotten. This would have been what, Alex is 31. So this would have been 33 years ago or something like that. So only 12 were sacrificed as a worship ritual to their goddess. I wonder if we really understand when we extrapolate the text, Romans 12, I wonder if we really understand what Paul and who Paul is talking to. Because not only is he talking to Jews, that I'll talk a little bit about their ritual in a moment, he is talking to pagans who at that point are still publicly continuing not only human sacrifice, animal sacrifice, and every other kind of sacrifice that you can imagine. And here's what he says in Romans 12 and 1. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. And I love that context because he's actually tying into his own revelation that it's by the goodness of God that we've been led to repentance. It's by the mercies of God. So the mercies of God, the goodness of God. He said, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies. Wait a minute. You are talking to people who have lived their entire life from a culture, not their, not only their entire life, but hundreds of years of their background, their family background, their religious background, whether he is speaking to Jew or Gentile, they all know what sacrifice is. They know that there is a selection. They know that there is a perfection. They know that there is a process to the sacrifice. And now he is telling them, if you're going to follow this Jesus, because remember two weeks ago, I told you that this Jesus 
See, this is where seeker, <laughs> kind of seeker-sensitive preaching kind of gets me sometimes, and I want to be that way. I try to be that way. I want to be nice, and y'all sitting there going, no, I don't know if you want to be nice or not. This is kind of, y'all so quiet. Y'all look at me like you're scared. No, the worst part's over, baby. The worst part's over. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. But I, but I, <laughs> but I, I think that, that we don't really understand how the ears, what they're listening to when they hear this. And he says, here's what I want you to do. Because this Jesus who I'm preaching told you to deny yourself. He not only said deny yourself, he said, hate your mom and your daddy. He said, hate your mom and daddy. As a matter of fact, he said, leave everything and follow me. It's a matter of fact, four different times. When Jesus said, follow me, before he said, follow me, he said something almost impossible to do. <laughs> before he said, follow me. And I think it, and, and I'm not being trite when I say this. Pastor Cliff, Pastor Charles, Pastor Stephanie, all, I, I'm not being trite when I say this. But I think there's a big difference between Jesus saying, deny everything and take up your cross and follow me, than to say, hey, if you'll come to my church, we'll give you a free iPhone. And I think it's a big difference taking up your cross and just, I was in even a, a, a service yesterday where the pastor kept giving an altar call and finally he said, hey, I'm going to dumb it down for you. If everybody's eyes closed, is there anybody that will just do this? He actually said it. Is there anybody that will just do this? And I'm sitting there knowing what I'm going to preach and I'm like, you know what? It don't really matter if they do that or not. Because this is about a surrender. This is about a complete ownership. And he said, present your body. Say that bodies, a living sacrifice. Here's the problem with the living sacrifice. Are you ready? A living sacrifice always tries to get off the altar. And what makes new covenant and old covenant different in old covenant, you could kill the sacrifice and it stayed dead. You burn it up. It was over and God's will was done in the new covenant. You're going to lay it on the altar today and it's going to get off the altar tomorrow. Then next Sunday, you're going to try to tie it down again and you're going to be walking through. You're going to be chastising your body. You're going to be praying. You're going to be fasting. You're gonna, and people are like, why is it a one and done? It's not a one and done. And I think that's the struggle. But here's the reason it's to be a living. Somebody say living continuous sacrifice and I love this holy somebody say holy do you know that holy means separated unto God because of God separated unto God because of God what are you separated to because I know people that say they're saved and this is my question awesome what do you say from you evidently wouldn't say from lying you're not saved from cheating. You're not saved from adultery. You're not saved from pornography. You're not saved from racism. You're not saved from pride. You're not saved from... Uh, so what are you saved from? I know we're saved to, but what are we saved from? Oh, why aren't y'all shouting today? I need you to shout a little bit, whatever. But holy, somebody say holy, separated to God. And, and then he says acceptable to God. And I like this part, which is, said, which is your reasonable service. Basically, he said it's the least you can do, baby, because Jesus was the supreme sacrifice. For God so loved the world. This is the thing I think you need to understand, the new covenant. God demands us to do less than he was willing to do. Every other religion has a deity that demands us to do something that he never did, that she never did. Every other religion, uh, that's why he said, offer unto God thanksgiving, pay thy vows to the Most High, and call upon me in the day of trouble. We have the only God that said, when you want to worship me, why don't you give me your trouble? Instead of giving me your baby, why don't you give me your heartache? Instead of giving me your firstborn, why don't you give me your sin? Why don't you repent and leave your sin at the altar? We have the only God who is worthy of it all. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our adoration. He is worthy of our worship. I know you don't hear me. See, there's a song. Somebody said, I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace. But Jesus, God's son, took my place. That ought to make somebody want to run the aisles up in here today. He is worthy. But the God who is worthy so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. <laughs> and when you think of that concept, now you have to understand where the apostle Paul is coming from, where he is talking about this, that I want you to present your body as reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove was that good and acceptable and perfect will of God.
He also, whoever wrote Hebrews, some think it was Paul, some don't. I wasn't there. I don't know. But whoever wrote Hebrews 13, verse 12, Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. And this is for those of you that love to study Judaism. It, it's, it's interesting. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him, say by Jesus, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share. So say the fruit of my lips, doing good and share. With such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Lord, I could preach that right now. So with my mouth, with my works, and with my money, with my stuff. Say my mouth, my works, and my stuff. Isn't that much better than giving your firstborn? Isn't that much better? Isn't our God incredible if we just want to stop and give God praise today? Isn't that absolutely? I think we just need to stop and say, thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for the sacrifice. But it does put some responsibility. And there's that word. Oh, there's that dirty word that we don't want to talk about. It puts some responsibility upon the believer. Somebody say responsibility. Because to whom much is given, much is required. And that takes me to the main context and text today is, is Genesis 22. And I mentioned Abraham earlier. But in verse 9 of 22, they came to the place which God told him. And Abraham built an altar there, placed the wood in order. He bound Isaac, his son, laid him on the altar. I just want to stop right there. Whew. And there's a lot more to this story I could get into. But you do know Isaac wasn't a baby at this point, right? By this point, he is a young man. By this point, as a matter of fact, if you read the whole story, you'll find that Isaac doesn't mention anything about the wood, about the knives, about the all. He doesn't, he's been there before. He understands everything, and he's smart enough to know there's no sacrifice, which means he has been there before. I submit to you that Abraham did this journey at least once a year, maybe more. I submit to you that he had raised his son in worship. He had raised him going to sacrifice. He was familiar with sacrifice. The story is not to me so much as Abraham as it is a young man. By this time, Abraham would have been at least 120 years old. And this young man could have took, taken Abraham out, could have hit him with a rock, knocked him down. He didn't have to submit to this. But because of the way he had been raised to worship, when Abraham said, God's going to provide a sacrifice, but by the way, why don't you just climb on up here, big boy? He climbed on up there willingly. Oh, let me keep reading the story. I'm, you're going to understand in a minute. Uh, and he bound Isaac, his son. And I'm telling you, he wasn't a child. Laid him on the altar and upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand, took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. God, help me preach this thing here today. This is why this is such a big deal to me today. Is you have to understand sacrifice from a historical perspective. God did not ask Abraham to do anything unusual. That's why neither he nor Isaac were confused at not one point in that scenario, go home and read Genesis 22. At not one point did Abraham question God, nor did Isaac. Why? Because Isaac's entire life, he had seen his uncles and his friends' fathers sacrifice their children to their gods in Ur. Abraham comes out of a family culture of hundreds of years that had already practiced human sacrifice. So all our God was doing was testing Abraham to see, can you worship me on the minimum 
that the world worships their God that has never spoke to, uh, you're not hearing me. See, this God said, Abraham, Abraham. This God made a covenant. This God literally made a covenant with Abram that said that your seed is going to be like the sand of the seashore and like the stars of the sky. Somebody say, he's a covenant preaching God. If I was a real preacher today, I'd wind up and start preaching about the God of covenant. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But here's the thing. If Abraham had not obeyed the voice of the Lord, there would have not have been an Isaac and there would not have been a Jacob and when we read it now we're reading it through the lens of our western culture and we're thinking it was a big deal all Elohim was asking him is are you willing to worship me Abraham like your brothers did are you willing to worship me maybe even like your own father did in Ur before you were even born I don't know how many family members they knew had been sacrificed to their God a God could, who could not speak a God that could not heal a God that that could not give promises, a God that looked like a rock, a God that looked like a tree, a God that looked like an animal. And yet this God who had made covenant with Abraham, who had proven to him that he would give him this promised son, even when he had misstepped and Ishmael was there, he said, I don't want Ishmael. I want your promised son. And Abraham, who was the father of the faithful, didn't even question it and said, the lad and I go up to worship and the lad and I shall return. Abraham, how can you say that? Because he knew he's a covenant keeper God. Now hold on. Isaac don't have any children yet. And his seed is going to be like the sand of the seashore. So I'm willing to surrender back to God that which God has already given me. Because if God gave him the first time, he can resurrect him the second time and he can raise him up. No, no, I'm going to slow down. Here's the theology. Where's my preachers at? It is a precursor. It is a glimpse into Calvary. It is a glimpse into the power of resurrection. It is a glimpse into the power of sacrifice. And so Abraham go, and that's why he doesn't even question. And Isaac doesn't even question it. And he wraps him down and he's going to lift his hand. But aren't you grateful that we have a God that all he wanted to know, all he was trying to see is, do you worship me at least on the level as the pagans do? If you love me that much, as I was praying about this week, I began to really get, really get convicted because I, I have friends that golf. And sometimes I wonder, I wonder at least do they pay as much to the kingdom as they pay on golf fee? You know, and, and so I'm always picking on my golf friends. But then I, then I realized I fly fish and I <laughs> fly fishing is not cheap. I've got poles that I won't even tell Stephanie what they cost. I, you know what I'm saying? But I wonder sometimes if our God sits back, and I've even had people try to debate this, especially because of our Pentecostal style, or we're a very spirit-filled church, and you have people that try to debate this and try to say, well, I don't know why you're so exuberant, whatever, but then I see your Facebook or your Instagram, whatever, when you're at a, a Cowboys game or, or, no, when you're at somebody that wins games. Uh, and and y'all know I'm a Cowboys fan. Everybody knows I'm a Cowboy. I love the Cowboys. I just wish they'd win. But uh, when... Uh, when your team is winning, wave at me if I'm talking to anybody in this room. Have you ever sit by somebody that even loses their mind? I've been with some of you even when Texas is playing. I mean, dear Lord, it shuts down. This, this city shuts down when the orange is happening. I mean, it's just, it's, it's awesome. And it's great. I love it. But I'm afraid how many of us have ever been tested? And this is the question that hit me today and hit me last night when I was praying. What is it in your life that if God asked for it, you wouldn't be able to give it? Boy, it's quiet. When he asked me that this week, first thing flashed in my mind was my grandkids. I know you got some too. You've got children. You've got careers. You have marriages. You have health. You have whatever we talked to a friend last night that's going through a great trial. And he said no great spiritual breakthrough happens without somebody paying a price. Without somebody. And we talked about counting the cost two weeks ago. But I want to ask you that again. 
if we're going to talk about living sacrifice and we're talking about, Pastor, we want to be radical. We, we, want to, we want to resurrect the radical. Okay, I do too. And that's why I'm preaching like this. It's why I'm living like this. It's why I'm praying into this in my personal life. And I'm like, okay, Lord, what are you trying to set back on fire? But when's the last time you heard and when's the last time you thought about it the way I'm preaching today when it really made sense to you and you really understand, wait a minute, I'm to be a living sacrifice, which means I'm to live in that perpetual place, that perpetual continuous place of my body being a living sacrifice that is just as costly to me as Abraham when he lifted the knife even though God intervened his heart had already broken if you're lifting the knife baby you've already done it in your head he had already submitted to God and surrendered him back to God and God considered it worship what is it and I just want to ask you today what is it that God may ask of you is there anything in your life that God would ask you to give him as worship that would cause you to walk away you say that's not possible well what about the rich young ruler you say that's not possible what about people through history is there anything is there anybody is there any circumstance that you could go through is there someone you love that could pass away is there someone that could have a horrible automobile accident could you get a diagnosis that would cause you to question God or is there something inside you that says when praise demands a sacrifice I'll worship even then I'll lift up holy hands Holy Spirit help us today I feel the presence of God moving in this room I just want you to close your eyes with your hands raised I want you to ask the Lord reveal to me is there anything in my life is there any anything in my life that if you ask for it that I haven't surrendered is there anybody is there any relationship is there any lifestyle <laughs> I gotta have my upper middle class pass I gotta have my vacations I got what, what if the Lord asked you for that what if the Lord asked you for that what if the Lord decided to take that? Could you worship even then? Lord, reveal to us right now. Let that spirit of praise begin to exuberate out of our spirit and out of our hearts even now. <laughs> thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. It's kind of sobering, isn't it? As I was, and I'll, I'll be wrapping up, but as I was, as I was uh, going through kind of the, the, about the sacrifice in Judaism, there's several things very interesting to me. First thing in a sacrifice is the priest selected the sacrifice. If you're in this room under my voice, you have been predestined to hear this word. God knew you would be here. He has selected you. So don't ask yourself, well, as God chose me, you know, I'm telling you, he has chosen you. He has selected you. There was a selection of the very best, of the purest of the pure. There was the selection, then there was the presentation. The presentation is when the person that bought the sacrifice, the lamb, the turtle dove, whatever, they would lay hands on it. Now, this is the difference between Old Covenant and New Covenant. Remember, in New Covenant, we lay hands on you so that things are lift off. In the Old Covenant, they laid hands on you so that their sin could be put. It was called imputed. That's just like what happened with Jesus on the cross. They would put their hands on the animal, and the animal would receive the intention or the sin of the person. They would, put, they would lay hands on the animal and put all of their sin, all of their lust, all of their hate, all of their murder, all of their anger. They would put it upon the animal, and then the animal would be sacrificed, and their sin would be obliterated. Isn't it amazing in the New Covenant when hands are laid on you, sickness is taken off, disease is taken off sin is taken off so there was the presentation then there was the consecration and I mentioned this earlier but consecration simply means holiness holiness and we've been doing a study lately holiness in its simplest form is separation God is holy which means God is separated and he said I need you to be separated and be consecrated and Jesus even taught us how to be in the world, but not of the world. Have you ever heard that in the world, not of the world? Now, let's just get honest. How many of us struggle with that? No, wave at me. How many of us struggle with that? How many of you, if you did not have an Oasis cap on, could we really tell you were saved by how you dress, how you work, how you talk, where you go? who your friends are. Man, I sound like an old-time preacher in here. 
what are you consecrated to? And I know many of us, we're consecrated to our jobs. We're consecrated to this. Some of you are even consecrated to the church. I'm not asking you to be consecrated to the church. I'm asking you, are you truly separated unto God to the point that when you are around or involved in things that are anti-Christ or anti-God, there is a separation that people notice. Even though you're kind, you're not being judgmental. There is a separation to you because you have considered it a sacrifice and you cannot participate in that because your body is a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God so when I studied this and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be ending here in just a moment but the scripture in Mark chapter 12 talks about this little because I'm looking at Old Testament I read the Apostle Paul but I'm looking at Old Testament New Testament if you look at real sacrifice when it comes to giving sacrifice when it comes to worship you can't preach like this without preaching about the widow and what we call her might or her micro penny it wasn't even a penny people say it was a penny it wasn't even a penny it was basically worthless but it was all that she had when it comes to giving when it comes to serving it's not about the amount it's about what's coming from our heart. And I'm preaching today radical sacrifice. Radical sacrifice. And Jesus said opposite of the treasury and saw how the people put money in the treasury and many who are rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites which made a quadrant and so he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Surely I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance. But she out of her poverty hmm, put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. Hmm. Radical sacrifice. I've stumbled around today, probably haven't done that good a job in preaching this, but I just feel the heaviness. And I don't, I don't want this to be in any way a condemning heaviness. I want this to be a holy heaviness. Because I'm going to have Lenten come in a moment, and we're going to pray, and we're going to ask you to commit. And there are people that are faithful in this house. We have people that have given so sacrificially already. We literally have had people, we had a lady cash out her 401K, literally cashed it out. I'm not going to give names. We have had people sell homes and give incredible sacrificial gifts. And you say, well, Pastor, how much money? It's not about money at this point to me. It's about all of us getting equal. It's about all of us entering into this new season in a season of sacrifice and submission, in a season of radical. Can you hear that right now? I'm grateful. We've got our chairs paid for. God has been doing incredible things. You ought to get excited. It's been, it's been awesome. It's been awesome. And, and that's the thing. It's glory. God's providing. He's going to provide. He's made us promises. He will provide just because he loves us. But sometimes as a pastor, we struggle because today, and I preach this, this is not about me just preaching a message. This is about us trying to get in the right spirit, in the right posture, in the right position. So if you don't mind just raising your hands right now. And I'm going to ask, is there anyone in this room that needs to pray this with me before Lenten comes? Uh, I just feel this strong and I, I know it may embarrass you but I'm going to ask you to stand not everybody but if you're in this room and you have never thought of living for God this way and you have never really thought of living as a sacrifice and you have never really thought of the cost and the price and there are things you have held on to and you realize you cannot do that and worship and you want to truly surrender today before we do anything else in this service I would ask you to stand and throw both hands to heaven and this entire church is going to pray for you and God is going to receive that as a sacrifice if there's anything in your heart that you, you're like Lord I have held that back I have held that idea that concept that, that career that baby that marriage that relationship that boyfriend that 
that hurt, that wound, that idea. I see people standing all over this earth. Father, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Lord, we surrender to you even now. We pray your anointing in this room. We pray your presence in this room. We pray your glory in this room. I thank you for people that are standing. I thank you for lives that are being transformed even now. I thank you for lives that are being transformed. Receive this as an offering. Every hand that is raised, specifically those standing. Father, let the fire fall on the sticks of our hands. Let the fire fall upon these sticks of our heart. And may you consume us with the wind of the Spirit. May you consume us with the fire of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you today. Thank you, Lord. Now can this entire church thank him and praise him and clap your hands and give God praise for that. No, you need to give God praise. I need people to get liberty in this room. We just surrendered. We just saw people lay things on the altar. We weren't judging. We weren't looking. We were celebrating. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah to Jesus. You can be seated. I've asked Linton to come today and just kind of share with you from his heart and where we are. I abbreviated a little bit of my remarks because I just, I just want to hear how many of you know that Linton has been an elder on this property for over 20 years? We had no idea they would become Oasis when we all talked about the dissolving of Round Rock Chapel and all this. We had no idea that he and Miss Bobby and so many other that they would decide to stay. It's been one of the greatest privileges of our life. But the sacrifice that this family, and as I was praying about today, I didn't know anybody better than, honestly, better than me to say what needs to be said right now. Because these people, this couple, have lived a life of sacrifice so that we can have what we have right now. You need to give God praise for that. Yeah.